Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. Hope you're well. I'm going to have to tone it down a little bit today, Joseph, because as you can tell, I lost my voice over the weekend. Actually, when I was speaking at an event, that was fun and <laughs> I did not have a voice, but I'm just barely getting my voice back. So I'm not going to be able to uh, give that intro with too much enthusiasm. But thanks for being on the show, buddy. My pleasure. It's great to be back here. Okay. So uh, good friends of mine and yours. Jeff Snyder and Lynn Alden were on a, a podcast the other day. Uh, Peter McCormick, I think is what Bitcoin did. Great podcast, by the way. And Peter's a really good dude. And they're going over uh, a, a simple question. Well, uh, I guess it's a simple question, but it's very hard to get an answer because it's it's so abstract, right? And you you really need to be precise with definitions. So the question they started with, is QE money printing. So now Lynn, of course, and I'm going to try to get them on the show. Lynn, of course, uh, her view was that it is money printing, uh, especially if the government is running deficits. And Jeff's view, of course, is that it's not. But unfortunately, you know, one of the great things about Jeff is, and one of the maybe not so great things about Jeff is he literally listens to zero podcasts. He, he doesn't listen to anybody. All he does is study like Fed minutes from and, and like history. He doesn't listen to shows. He doesn't listen to my podcast. <laughs> he doesn't listen. To, so he doesn't even when someone asks him if uh, is QE money printing, he doesn't. Even, I don't think he realizes that what they're asking is does QE impact M two. So if someone just so okay, let's start here, and I've, I've got a list of questions so we can really be precise. So let's start by asking, instead of does, is QE money printing, does QE increase M2? Yes or no? What's your 100%. take? 100%. Uh, we can see that over and over again. It, it's really obvious. You can, so, um, you know. So, just, it, so if you yes. could go through kind of the mechanics there, we could tease that out. Sure, sure, sure. So let's just take a, take a look at it from an investor's perspective. Let's say that me, I'm an investor and I go and I, and I, um, Let's say I sell, I have treasuries and I sell them. And at the end of the day, the Fed buys them. How does that work? So first of all, the Fed prints money, prints money, and these are called reserves. And then uh, let's say buys them. But the problem is, George, as you well know, that me, I have an account at a commercial bank. I don't have an account at the Fed. So when the Fed prints reserves and wants to, uh, wants to, buy treasuries from me, you know, I, I literally can't happen because, you know, the Fed creates reserves and puts it in a, someone who put, and I don't have an account at the Fed to receive those reserves. So what would happen is that my commercial bank steps in between us. So what the Fed would do is they will print, let's say a thousand dollars in reserves and send it to my commercial bank who then turns around and credits my checking account at the commercial bank by a thousand dollars. So at the end of the day, I have $1,000 less in treasuries and $1,000 more in deposits at a bank. And deposits at a bank is what you would think of as M2. And if you look at what happened in 2020, tremendous, tremendous increase in M2. Uh, so, you know, that that seems really obvious to me that that's how it works. Okay, so now let's think about it through the lens of instead of the Fed, and I know they don't directly buy, but let's just assume for a moment that the Fed were to purchase 100% of a QE round from uh, other commercial banks. Yeah. So then how does that impact M2 or does it? It, it doesn't. So that's a, that's a really good subtle point. So let's say that I'm a commercial bank and then I sell my treasuries to the Fed. So if I sell $1,000 in treasuries to the Fed, the Fed prints up $1,000 in reserves and sends it to me. But unlike the previous example, commercial banks have accounts at the Fed. So what the Fed would do is they would print $1,000 in reserves and add it to my uh, account at, a, at, the, at the Fed, my Fed account. So commercial banks have accounts at the Fed. So at the end of the day, the commercial bank, instead of having $1,000 in treasuries, has $1,000 in reserves. Now, reserves are not broad money, so that wouldn't increase it. Right. So I think the counter argument would be, okay, that makes sense. But if the government is running big deficits or just deficits, period, 
and those banks are, let's say, buying the treasuries. Okay, great. Now we've got the reserves going down into the TGA from the aggregate total of the commercial banking system. All right. And then what happens is the uh, the, the treasury would go ahead and spend those, so the bank reserves would go back up, and then that would increase M2. And then the Fed comes in and then buys those treasuries from the banking system and replace, replaces the bank reserves. So in that process, if the government is deficit spending, then M2 is increasing. But I think that the subtlety there is it's not necessarily the QE that's doing the increase in M2. It's the fact that a bank is buying from a non-bank. And as long as a bank buys from a non-bank, even if it's the Fed buying from the Treasury, you're going to have an increase in M2 money supply. And so, and so I, but I think the counter argument there would be, well, yeah, but the banks wouldn't be buying from the treasury if the Fed was not doing QE. So they're just acting as a middleman between the Fed's balance sheet and the treasury. And if so, then you could argue that that process is increasing M2, even though it's QE, if that QE is prompting the banks to buy where they otherwise wouldn't. Do you see that argument? Well, uh, that was, I, I think I might have gotten a little bit lost there, but I let, let me, let me, let me, yeah. yeah, I didn't do a very good job no, explaining no, that. I'm let sorry. Let me actually broaden the point a little bit. Okay. So, um, like we know, when a commercial bank makes a loan to someone, they create deposits, right? So yep. uh, they go turn around and they simply credit. Uh, the the borrower's account with with deposits the same process happens when a commercial bank buys a security so yep. if instead of um, let's say uh, instead of me getting a loan from a commercial bank i sell my charger security to commercial bank the way they pay for it is by crediting my account there and so when a commercial bank feels like buying treasury securities or agency mbs uh, or anything else they, they want to buy now to be clear, commercial banks are highly regulated, so they, they only buy a very narrow set of assets that would create, that would broaden M2. So it's so whether or not they decide to, to go and buy treasury securities or not isn't necessarily dependent upon uh, what the Fed does. There's actually a whole lot of other calculations that, that go into play as well. I'll give you an example. So um, when the Fed was doing a lot of QE in 2020, that increased, it, increased M2 a lot, right? So a commercial bank has a lot of deposits and they have an inflow of deposits. Now, one of the way things they like to do if they have a lot of inflows and deposits uh, is to go out and, and buy longer dated securities. Uh, so what, what, we, what you see as a QE encouraging them to go buy assets is, is in part this mechanism. Uh, the reason they like to do that is because they think of these longer dated assets as a hedge to their to deposits. This may sound strange, but commercial banks actually think about deposits as long dated, well, at least medium dated liabilities. Mm, because okay. in practice, let's say that, let's say I have a deposit at a commercial bank. Now it's a deposit I can withdraw anytime that I want, right? But in practice, I don't withdraw it every day. In fact, I, I usually leave a good chunk of money in the bank every day because I just don't need it. Right. So when a commercial bank is looking at this, they're like, yeah, this guy, he can take out money anytime he wants in practice on average. Maybe he leaves it there um, for a long time, let's say five years or something like that. So when they get a lot of deposits, a bank want, doesn't want to take too much uh, interest rate risk, right? Unless you're Silicon Valley Bank, then you, you kind of go all, all out. <laughs> um, but a, a, a normal bank doesn't want to take too much interest rate risk. So they see deposits come in. Oh, deposits, mm, let's say about four or five uh, year, it's like the four or five uh, year uh, loan to to me, the bank, I got to go buy some some uh, medium term assets, let's say treasury securities like that. And so uh, that's usually why you can see sometimes that when you do QB, you, you have banks buy more uh, yeah. securities. Yeah. And, and then those banks buying or, or selling can impact M2 if that's Absolutely. what you're strictly looking at or Absolutely. just looking at deposits, M1, however you want to measure it. Okay, going back, let, let's just do another thought experiment here. So, Janet Yellen selling treasuries uh, auction. Let's just assume for a moment that the only buyer at the auction is a bank, just JP Morgan. Okay. okay. And so, in my mind, that's a bank buying from a non bank. 
uh, the treasury is a non-bank. So what happens is the reserves go from JP Morgan's account down to the TGA. And yeah. the TGA go ahead and spends those reserves. And yeah. then the T by the TGA spending those reserves, they're increasing M2. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that's right. You see where I'm going with that? Yeah, yeah. So that's, so, that's it, if a bank buys it. If a bank buys correct. it, basically the reserves go out, like exactly like how you described it, reserves go out of the of the bank's checking account into the TGA and comes back and back on the bank's balance sheet. But then, of course, uh, it's spent to someone who, who receives a deposit. Yeah, so then the deposits on net balance increase with or without QE. Yes, that's right. exactly so, right. So then when QE comes in, then just like you were saying earlier, you could argue, well, that it's it's not really increasing M2 because the process of M2 increasing was done by the bank buying from the treasury, not necessarily the Fed buying from the bank. Oh, well, there's, they're not mutually exclusive though. So um, like, like we mentioned before, a bank buying a bank buying a treasury security would increase M2. And you highlighted one of the mechanisms, let's say that buying it at auction money goes out of the bank's checking account through the TGA and gets spent back into the banking system, deposits increase, or you could have the bank directly buy from, uh, from an investor. So yeah. that's one channel. So those are two channels that this can happen. Um, but, you know, separate from that, even if the banks do nothing, you know, the Fed is buying from non-banks and that would also increase them too. So you have non-mutually exclusive channels. Right. So, but then focusing on if the Fed is buying from the bank, I, I think um, I think Lynn's point there would be, okay, but if let's just assume for a moment, Janet Yellen has that treasury auction. Okay. And uh, if the Fed wasn't doing QE, the banks wouldn't buy. <laughs> let's just assume that it would be all non-banks. And okay. therefore that in and of itself would not increase M2, right? Because then it's just kind of circular. You're decreasing deposits. Exactly. Uh, by buying the treasuries, but then you're increasing them by Janet Yellen spending those exactly. Uh, that, yes, those I agree with reserves that. back into the economy. You know, I agree with that. Uh, so uh, the the fact that uh, QE is prompting the banks to buy effectively means that the process of QE, even if it's just through the banking system alone, is impacting the level of M two. Um. Well, because because well, it's incentivizing the banks to buy in the first place. Yes, that's one channel, but but also because part of it is being purchased by non banks as well. I mean, non banks are also selling to the Fed as well. So, um, yeah, so there's two channels there. Yeah, so just trying to compartmentalize, uh, it's just a transaction between the Fed and a bank, or a transaction between the Fed and a non bank. Um, it, it's just I, I'm, yeah. I think you and I are saying the exact same thing. Yeah, yeah. That, that in order to determine if QE is 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 truly money printing or impacts M2 money supply, if it's going strictly through the banking system, you've got to compartmentalize that entire process of the banks buying from the treasury and then the Fed buying from the banks. And you've got to realize that the, that the actual part of that process that increases M2 isn't necessarily QE, but it's the banking system buying from the treasury. That's what's increasing M2 money supply. No, I think in practice, they both happen though. They, they both happen. So we, we definitely saw banks buy a lot of treasury securities in, in 2020, but you know, we also saw a lot of people uh, who are not banks uh, sell to the treasury, sell to the, basically sell to the Fed as well. Yeah, yeah. In yeah. practice, it's, it's gonna be a mixture of both, or yes. maybe sometimes it's definitely more leaning on the non-bank side. Uh, but we were just, but I was just going through kind of a theoretical and yes. assuming that it all yes. was banks. Right. Right. Okay. It, it, so now we talked about how it can increase M2, but now let's try to dive deeper into the question of, is it money printing? And so this is where I think Snyder views this because he sees, and I don't want to put words in his, his mouth or Lynn's mouth, but you know, I, I'm, I'm friends with them. So I'll, I'll, I'll put a few words in their mouth, you know, cause I think I know their argument pretty well. And then I'm going to have them on the show in the future too. So that's going to be a great conversation. But I think Jeff would say, listen, the, the treasuries are money. So if you're just replacing, if it's an asset swap, then it's not really money printing. And now this kind of dovetails 
on, on your view and what you're talking to Jesse about the other day, that when we think about money printing, maybe we should more so think about purchasing power. Yes, and, that's, and, I think and, that's and, the key. And, yeah, and the way I look at that, Joseph, is maybe we should just think about the impact of the asset side of the aggregate balance sheet. So if the aggregate balance sheet is increasing, even though that might not impact M2, is that money printing? Maybe because you're increasing the overall purchasing power. And I know you've really thought about this a lot. So can you explain your view on that? Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna, give, this is gonna be a little bit subtle, but I, I think it's really helpful in understanding this. Now, I, I think you, you, you definitely nailed the point that you know it's an asset swap so let's think about the investor community excluding banks all right so excluding banks i'm an investor um so i sold my treasuries to the fed and i get bank deposits instead my overall asset size my overall purchasing power my overall wealth not really changed right although m2 has gone down uh no 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 if i sold it to the fed m2 went up Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, that, I should have said it impacted M2. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, there was an M2 impact. It, it went up, but it's, there I I hold fewer treasuries. I, I hold more M2. Okay. So my overall asset size is unchanged. Purchasing power is unchanged. And, and that's why that doing massive QE didn't result in CPI inflation. I think that's pretty clear by now, right? We've been doing a decade of, of, of QE back, um, and not just us, but many other people, many other central banks in the world as well. But here's the more subtle point is that now let's look at it from the bank's perspective. Now the banks have more reserves, right? So their overall cash holdings actually increased. So at the end of the day, if I'm a non-bank investor, my overall asset purchase, my overall asset position is unchanged. But if I'm a commercial bank, I have more reserves now. So I actually do have more uh, liquidity and so forth. Now I could say purchasing power, but for a bank, that's a, that's a tricky thing to do because the bank can always just, you know, buy stuff and credit someone's account. Mm -hmm. So the bank ends up being stuck with more cash than they had beforehand. Cash by cash, I mean deposits at the Fed. Now, what do they do with that cash? Now in the past, what they've done is, you know, they've looked around and my gosh, repo, uh, it's offering a better return than cash at the Fed. And from a regulatory standpoint, they're both the same. So repo trading above IOR, I'm going to invest in some repo. Or maybe treasuries trading above IOR, I'm going to buy some treasuries. So in that sense, it, it actually does impact. Banks kind of have more cash to deploy. Uh, but here's the thing. A, a bank is, is not you or I, right? They, they don't go and they don't buy cars. They don't buy you know, ice cream and steak and so forth. Uh, they, they buy financial assets. And I think that's part of the mechanism where you see why a QE has been uh, inflationary for financial assets because you got a bank and, okay, maybe they go and buy some treasury securities. Yields go lower. Maybe that encourages other people who are not banks to, to go and you know, buy riskier assets. Okay, so now let's go. We touched because I'm, I'm trying to navigate here. Usually I'd go off on a tangent here, uh, but I'm trying to do my best to stay close to my notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we, <laughs> so um, I think you, I've heard you say also on a couple podcasts that this view that uh, let's just say that a, uh, a non-bank entity is buying a treasury. That's kind of where I, I was going with it. I was diverging from you there. Uh, Non-bank entity buying a treasury, then that's going to decrease the deposits uh, temporarily. Let's just say it goes into the yes, TG. Yes, exactly. Right? It does. Before she yeah. spends it out. So yep. you're decreasing the deposits there. Or if uh, you're just buying from, a non-bank's buying from a bank, then that's this, the opposite, right? Instead of increasing deposits, that's just going to decrease deposits because exactly the way they're right. paying for that is the bank is just decreasing the amount in their account. Exactly right. And and so uh, if that's the process, M2 has gone down, but the aggregate balance sheet, the asset side has not. Or the way you are putting it, the purchasing power hasn't decreased because the only thing that non-bank did is just simply trade savings. Yes, from the non-bank's perspective, yes. Yeah, they just traded savings for a treasury. 
their the asset side of their balance sheet hasn't changed. And yes. by the way, I'd also add too that that was low velocity money. And I think this is something a, a piece of nuance or detail that no one talks about. It's very important that uh, I think it's very inflationary, even if M2 doesn't increase, if the government is basically taking uh, low velocity money, i.e. savings, and turning it into high velocity money, i.e. checking. Uh, no, it's exactly right. I mean, I look upon it like this huge life cycle almost, right? So if you're an investor, you have low velocity money, like you mentioned, and you buy a treasury security. The treasury takes that money and then sends it to, let's say, to uh, social security, or maybe right. goes it to, uh, let's say, um, you know, a, a, just to pay government worker wages. Well, when they receive that money, they're, they're more likely to spend it than the rich person who bought the treasury, right? So uh, then they go and spend it, and then the, the dollars move around in the financial system. Eventually, of course, because in our economy, uh, wealth is highly concentrated, profits flow to the rich people, then it ends up back into the rich person's hands low velocity money and who gets lends it to the treasury and that's that cycle uh, that cycle restarts again and that's part of the reason why i think government deficit spending is so inflationary hmm you know it's really interesting now i'm going to go off on a tangent I'm gonna <laughs> forget my notes for a second but you know what's really interesting about that is i gave this pre or i tried to give a presentation in belize my my voice was cutting out but um it was pushing back against the idea that the dollar is doomed if you have de-dollarization. And what I was saying, it, my point is, you've got to look at the aggregate balance sheet outside the United States. And let's just say that 100% of those dollars were created in a, in a unique way from the standpoint they were supply that also had intrinsic demand because they were lent into existence. Yes. So therefore you have supply that's being created, but it also has future demand that is being created. So even if let's say Saudi Arabia dumps all of their dollars, okay, that, that's fine. Let's just say they, they sell for yuan or, or, or whatever, right? They sell for euros or yen or something. Well, those dollars, let's say there's 95 trillion on the asset side, 95 trillion of debt. All that happens is it just circulates to another account. The, yes. The, the, the debt is still there. Therefore, that outstanding demand. So I could see an environment where it would increase velocity because, you know, those people are maybe buying those dollars to spend them. But sooner or later, to your point, it goes through that life cycle. And I never really thought about it that way. But I, th I, I said sooner or later, it's going to go from high velocity money right back to low velocity money. And then you might have a spike or a, a, a decrease slightly in the dollar. But then it's going to go right back because those long-term forces of the demand that's created by the debt in the first place are going to take over. And it, it, it's it's kind of the, it, the same idea, but I just presented it in a different way. Yeah, no, the U.S. Treasury is like a huge recycler of dollars, taking low-velocity money and, and putting it into uh, people who would spend it, changing it into high-velocity money. Um, it's going to do that uh, to a great extent the coming the coming decade. So let's assume for a moment, this is another uh, thought experiment that I did not in the presentation, but when I was just uh, going over the thinking about the presentation is I said, okay, if there's two forms of dollars or two forms of money, right? You have one form that's like green pieces of paper and that would be money that's created that is just supply. That's all it is is supply. Just like a gold coin, right? Or a bank reserve. All that is is supply. But if you have the JP Morgan create dollars or Deutsche Bank or Euro dollar bank XYZ, now all of a sudden, like I said, it's not only supply, but it's demand. Hmm. So if you had a system where there was no base money, where 100% of the currency units were created by bank lending, would that have, would it be less likely to experience consumer price inflation? with that type of monetary system, because instead of having some currency units that are just supply, 100% of the currency units would have supply and a demand component in place at the very origin of the currency unit to begin with. That's a really good idea. That's a really I, good I know thought. I'm just throwing that out. I was just curious to get your quick thoughts on that. So, I know it's kind of a 
uh, like right you mentioned, field question. All right, like you mentioned, when I when I when dollars are created from lending, it creates its own demand because one day I have to repay that loan, right? right? right. So, it, so the supply and demand are, are balanced, and um, some somehow I, I uh, th that I don't have to constrain what I'm willing to buy and, and sell because one day I'm going to need to get those dollars back. Now that's going to be completely different when you when you have let's say the government step in because the government is let's say creating dollars and in theory they could raise taxes to repay their debt but in practice they don't so you kind of have all these dollars floating around that um that 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 don't have to be extinguished in the future yeah like now, i i when i was thinking about that joseph i was specifically thinking about the legal tender act of 1862 I don't when know the government came is. sorry it's just they wanted they're trying to fund the civil war Okay. And they thought, okay, we can issue T bills or we can issue government debt. That's not fair to the taxpayer. This was, I actually read their notes, believe yeah. it or not. Uh, mm. And they said, well, that's not fair to the taxpayer because then they've got to pay higher interest rates and, you know, we've got to tax more. So they thought, well, we could just print these green pieces of paper and maybe we won't have inflation. If we don't <laughs> have inflation, then, you know, great. We're, but if we do, then it's just like taxing the taxpayer anyway. That was kind of their, their rationale. So they, they, they literally printed green pieces of paper. We all know what happened. They had huge inflation. But that was a, a, like the best example I could think of uh, in, in the 1800s of just pure supply money. So I think that, so I think there's a, a couple of ways that I would think about this. One is that ultimately, you know, in terms of demand, you can have demand, not just uh, so dollar spending, not just some physical goods, but they can also be, be spent on, on financial assets. And so... What, what this lo looks like to me is that because ultimately the, the way the economic system is structured, ultimately it ends up into the hands of people who have low velocity. Right, right, right. Uh, but, they have high, but they have high demand for financial assets. And so at the end of the day, something like this is inflationary for financial assets. Mm. So uh, because I think that's the ultimate home for, for all these excess dollars is just to buy stuff, hoping that they will go even higher in price. That number goes like larger and, so until the debt is due and then that what's weird about that is then that uh high velocity money or accounts let's say that probably took out the debt to begin with now all of a sudden they've got to figure out a way to get those dollars back from the low velocity accounts in order to pay down that debt and and that's especially outside of the united states uh, an ar could be an argument you know for why the dollar may spike because you've got all the dollars that are created with demand going to low velocity, but then those checking accounts have to get those dollars back somehow. How do they do it? If there's not high velocity of money, the global economy is slowing down, then all of a sudden it makes much, much more difficult because that dollar cash flow going back to the borrowers in the first place is uh, limited. That, that could that could happen. And if that's the case, you would you would see it actually. I, I would think you see it more in higher interest rates instead. So um, let's say they're, they're trying to roll their debt over. They're, so they have dollar debt due uh, and um, they have trouble getting it through their normal cash flow. They could ah, just right. try to borrow it by, by, by um, you know, willing to pay higher interest rates. Uh, it's possible they could go to the spot market, um, but, but usually people don't like to do that because then they take on a lot of currency risk. So right. I can sell my local currency to get dollars today, but um, to, to pay, pay back to repay my loan. But then, you know, in the, in the future, let's say that um, when I borrow again, when I have to repay my loan again, the currency could change a lot. Yeah, but see if that interest rate goes up, then that makes the burden of paying it back even greater. <clears throat> now you need more dollar cash flow to pay back the same amount of principal. Or you could- if You're rolling it over to a higher rate, you know? Or even pay higher interest rates again next time. So- Yeah, <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. People okay, like so to watch the uh, the interest rates as a, as a tell for, for funding strings abroad. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing we forget. We think that the Fed is just trying to micromanage interest rates for the United States, but effectively they're micromanaging interest rates on the short side for, uh, you know, 70% of the global transactions. Uh, they they, they are, they are. They have the FX swap facility, puts a ceiling on, um, on, uh, on how, high the, uh, how high foreigners borrow dollars at. So that, that's definitely helpful for them. Okay, so now I want to get back to the, the page here. And another uh, kind of, I don't know if it's a di disagreement. I, I think that's too strong of a word. But a, another uh, component of their framework that may differ, and I think this is a, a lot of people, 
is, I mean, you can describe it a lot of different ways, but the way I look at it in my mind, and tell me if this makes sense, is you've got to start by asking where the banks are settling, right? Because we all know that the banks can create limitless amounts of money. But that's not the problem. The problem is when they have to transfer those deposits somewhere or those liabilities somewhere else. You know, that's what uh, Silicon Valley Bank ran into, as you know. It's not the fact that all these uh, tech guys wanted green pieces of paper. They yep. said, no, I don't trust you, so <laughs> I want you to transfer my account over to J.P. Morgan. And they said, okay, well, that's transferring a liability, but oh, shoot, now we've got to have an asset. So we've got to sell an asset that just took a massive haircut. Yep. And so now we have to do that. Now we've got a big problem there, right? Yep. But it's not that the that the banking system as a whole wasn't able to create the cash that Silicon Valley Bank needed. Yeah. Uh, so another way to think about this is, did they need bank reserves? Yes, they did. Yes. They yes. needed bank reserves. But more so, they just needed cash. So if that cash would have been a liability of J.P. Morgan, assuming let's just assume that Silicon Valley Bank had an account with J.P. Morgan, and they just credited their account however much cash they needed, and the offsetting asset was a, a loan on J.P. Morgan's balance sheet. They just created, you know, they gave them credit or whatever. Yeah. So that would have functioned the exact same way as those bank reserves. Yeah. So it's not that they needed base money. It's that they just needed cash, period. And we all know that the banking system can create that cash if they want to, if the collateral's right, if you know, look at through Snyder's lens, or the way I kind of look at it, if the counterparty risk is low enough. Yes. So then, so for me, what this boils down to is the idea that people need to really understand if they want to understand the global monetary system is that banks can settle on the Fed's balance sheet. But they can also settle off the Fed's balance sheet. So then, it, it, and nobody understands that, Joseph. Nobody. So can, I mean, obviously you do, but can you help uh, maybe articulate that better than I can so people can get their head around the fact that, that a system can exist, it can theoretically exist without the Fed's balance sheet at all, where banks can send these liabilities back and forth because they can create their own assets, like a correspondent banking relationship. Yes, exactly right. So I, I would actually say that that's actually how the banking system functioned before the great financial crises. Yeah. So before the great financial crises, as we all know, that uh, you know there was only maybe fifty billion dollars in reserves at the Fed. So a lot of a lot of money was, was basically moving around the banking system, where banks were basically lending to each other on an unsecured basis. So that's mm -hmm. called the federal funds market. And, and that worked really well um, for, for many for a long time until, of course, um, someone realized that, you know, it's, it's not just about liquidity or anything like that. Credit risk matters as well. And so they were settling with IOUs from each other until, you know, one bank went bust. And then they realized that, you know, uh, if I if I settle with IOUs from a, from another bank, you know, maybe that bank goes bust. And so I can't settle with their IOUs anymore. And so when that happens, everyone gets worried that, well, there might be a chain reaction. Maybe this other bank is also not good as well. So, you know, I, I can't really lend them money and, I, and, you know, I can't really lend them money and no one's going to lend to me. So I can't really use uh, bank IOUs uh, to, to settle payments with another bank anymore. So what happens then, then uh, is that you could have a financial crisis. And that's why today everyone uh, basically, according to the regulations, it, Everyone has to hold their liquidity, not with another bank, like a corresponding bank situation, um, but at the at a checking account at the Fed, um, because you know the Fed is the Fed. You know when you hold cash at the Fed, it's a liability of the Fed, but there's no credit risk there because the Fed is not going to go under. And so everyone is happy to accept a liability of the Fed as a settlement of payments. So there's a credit risk component to that as well. So going back to the uh, Silicon Valley example, yes, J.P. Morgan could have lent. Um, Know, could have lent a lot of money to Silicon Valley Bank, but then JP Morgan would be worried that what if Silicon Valley Bank goes bust? You know, then I'm not going to get my money back. And so that's why they that's that's why they want to do it. Could they could they have lent those treasuries out in repo to get the cash they needed? Or or use a discount window? Uh so they did. They did. They, they, so what happens uh, a lot is uh they go to the federal home loan bank system, which is and 
which is a kind of like a lender of next last resort. It's a government sponsored entity and okay. they would take as collateral mortgage loans, not necessarily MDS. They could do that, but just whole loans as well. Okay. And if you, so what happened with us, the, the bank run was just so severe that they basically lost almost all their deposits in a few mm. days. That, that, that they were beyond so the only way to, to quote unquote bail them out is if they could have got a hundred cents on the dollar for all those assets that were only worth 70 cents on the dollar. That would have helped them a lot. But you know, what? if you looked at, so their court of filings show that they were, oh, okay. So the FDIC, I forget which filings they were, the regulatory filings show that mm -hmm. they, they were basically having just tremendous runs that, you know, even if everyone lent them money at the end of the day, they'd have a, they'd have a balance sheet where the liabilities are basically all emergency borrowings because basically everyone left. Wow. Uh, when that happens, there's, there's no, there's no going back. It's, it's over. Yeah. So, um, it, let's go back to the GFC there. Cause that, that was a really good example where you've got the counterparty risk just going through the roof. So even if the aggregate balance sheet of the banking system could have bailed out Lehman brothers, let's say, or could have given, uh, AIG or whatever the liquidity they, they needed or the cash, uh, they didn't because they, they don't want to, you know, I don't want to hold that or try to catch that falling knife, so to speak. Is there a component there looking at it through Jeff's framework of collateral, though? Because um, if you the way I always look at it is if you have a pie, a full pie or circle of collateral. And if overnight, you know, half of that collateral goes away. That's a big deal, you know, because if let's say that risk increases, then if you had enough collateral, then the banks would say, okay, I'll go ahead and lend you the money, but you need to give me treasuries. You need to give me something. So, you know, if there's a 50, 50 chance you go bust tomorrow, I've got something that's just as good as, uh, as the money that I lent you, you know, so to speak. And so if that, and that was, let's say in 2007, that was mortgage backed securities. They were part of that pie or part of that pie chart. And all of a sudden overnight, they're not. <laughs> so how do you, what was that? It's like a chicken or egg, right? No, that's definitely part of it, right? So one way to get liquidity is you can you can borrow from another bank. So intrabank unsecured lending, borrowing and that you know that that went away. Um, another part, another way you can get liquidity if you really need it is like you suggest, uh, you do a secured borrowing. So you take collateral and you and you pledge it for a loan. Uh, back then, as you note, that uh, you know there was tremendous uncertainty as to how vast classes of collateral were worth right so you had of course the mortgage-backed securities which people thought were good but were actually not good and so you don't know how to value that anymore so if you thought that you had a bunch of liquidity because you could always pledge this stuff to 100 cents on the dollar okay and then the next day you can only pledge it for 80 cents on the dollar then you you have a, you have a lot less liquidity and you you might not be able to survive anymore yeah. So, th th so when the Fed stepped in and did quantitative easing, there was would you consider that money printing? Um, well, so I always think quantitative easing is money printing. It's just that it doesn't necessarily have to be inflationary, right? You are increasing the amount of. You can either think of it as cash on deposit at the Fed or even cash on deposit at the bank. So that, that always rises because of quantitative easing. So if you think of that as money, yeah, it's money printing. It's just that it's not necessarily inflationary because there's also or, the Or it's not swap. necessarily in flat, in, impacting deposits. It, I, so, commercial banking deposits, commercial banking deposits. So if you look at the great financial crisis, you, you'll note that... Um, Banks actually cut back on their credit creation a lot. And so they were actually shrinking on the loans they were making. But the weird thing is that their deposits didn't decline. They did not decline because even as the banking sector was shrinking, QE was adding deposits into the banking system, the deposit liabilities. So uh, that that always happens, actually. So the banks are just not that big a part of of uh, the the uh, people who sell to the Fed when, they, when the Fed is doing QE. Okay, so to, just to clarify there, the, the reason that likely happened was because in 2008, deposits didn't go down because the Fed was buying those. Yes, exactly right. Uh -oh. We saw a play out in 2020. Oh, sorry, there, there, I think there's a skip back then. I didn't catch the last few seconds. 
Okay. And so the uh, back in 2008, the reason why deposits went down is because the Fed was buying from non-banks, similar to what we saw in 2020. Exactly right. The Fed was buying from non-banks. Deposits should have gone down because the, the banking system was, was shrinking. You can see the loans and leases outstanding. Bank credit outstanding was declining. Deposits should have declined along with that in 2008, but it did not. It did not because the Fed was continually adding deposits through quantitative easing, just like what happened in 2020. So I th would, would you agree that a better way to frame this question is not, is QE money printing, but does QE impact M2? And if so, how? It always impacts M2. And exactly like we discussed earlier, it's because a lot of the people who sell to the Fed are uh, non-bank investors. Right. But, but just, just to be clear, it, it always does in practice. But theoretically, it wouldn't have to if yes, the Fed bought I strictly agree. from banks. I agree. Then, I agree. then you're just dealing with base money. You're not really dealing with deposits or M2. Yes. Okay. Yeah. This is this is great stuff, by the way, Joseph. I, I really uh, appreciate you going through all these. I know it can be kind of difficult to go through these thought experiments on the fly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> why you need no advance warning whatsoever. <laughs> but uh, this is this is really helping me out. So and I'm sure the the viewers. We got 800 people on here right now. Are really nice. enjoying it as well. Okay, so now I'd, I'd like to go over maybe a different thought experiment that I, I've tried to go through several times on whiteboard because it would make sense that this idea, and I'm, I'm sure you've heard it before, that if money is lent into existence, you've got principal plus interest. And therefore, there are never enough currency units to satisfy the existing debt. So uh, the way I always like to frame it is if you have a $10 loan, that's all the money that exists. You've got $10 in the entire monetary system, but you have $10 of principal plus, let's just say $10 worth of interest that is due. So how do you pay, or is it even possible to pay $20 of interest with only $10 in the system? And this is what go, you know, this argument is, is obviously very rational. Um, but the argument there is that the, in a debt based system, the debt has to continue to expand or else, or else the system will collapse. So uh, yeah, go that's, ahead, a good, go ahead. that's a good, interesting point. And I've thought about this before. Uh, I'll just know two things that in practice, the debt always increases. So you always have more money to pay. But on another note is that no, it doesn't have to increase. And that's because, uh, Let's say that, for example, we have an asset bubble. Let's say back to your example, there's only $10 in the entire system, but there are also house prices, there are also equities and so forth, and they can go up in price, right? So you can kind of sell those things and, uh, you know, just to pay your debt. So in, in a sense, the velocity of that dollar increases. Yeah, so you, that's, that's the key. Because it, it, I've modeled this up on a whiteboard and just tried to play around with it for hours on end, just trying to see, okay, how would this be possible? And just the simplest way I can describe it is if you just had two customers, let's say, uh, of a bank, and you only had one bank, and there were only two people in that economy, and the bank lends uh, the money into existence, so the $10 in one account, yeah. and then that guy or gal, whatever, goes out to buy the stuff to create goods and services, let's say. Yeah. Uh, so then the first debt payment, let's say is $2, $1 principal, $1 interest. So on the asset side of the balance sheet of the uh, bank's balance sheet, you've got that $10 of, of principal loan. So when that $1, now that drops down to nine. Yep. But then what happens is you've got a, another dollar that is an interest payment. So if I'm not mistaken, that dollar would go on to the, it would increase the, the bank's equity. Yes, yes. So, and therefore, then they could take that dollar, if you want to think about it that way, and they could spend that back into the economy. And therefore, let's just assume that would go back onto the balance sheet of the person that uh, borrowed the money. And now all of a sudden he made a $2 payment, so he's got $8, but that interest payment goes back into his pocket. So now he has $9 and then you just work that process all the way down. 
until you get to zero and it nets out. And that's the way. And so I always say velocity, meaning the bank has to spend that interest back into the economy or that interest payment, if you want to look at it. And if they're doing that, then you can pay back uh, $20 of debt with $10. So I know theoretically it works on the whiteboard, but I didn't know if in practice that is how it works. But it kind of sounds like you would agree that in practice it might work that way as well. It could, but I mean, let's go back to our example. What if the person chooses to pay interest rates? Let's say we go to a barter economy, pay, pays it with some Tesla stock or something like that, right? It, no, you, they can't. It's an asset, and you know, maybe they would just ask the bank to buy it from them and get the bank deposits to repay it and so forth. So, what we settle our debts in is definitely has to be cash out of bank, but that's only a, a small part of the overall wealth. So, so as long as you have enough people out there making markets and buying and selling stuff, then you can just you know liquefy your wealth to, to get the to get the cash you need to repay it. So that small amount of cash in in the system, uh, you just more intensely use it, and and it could be a recycling aspect like you mentioned by paying the bank and the bank going back. But if you have just just enough uh, people in the economy, enough cash there, they could just let's say sell stock to someone else in the economy, get cash to repay the bank. So just move that cash, the velocity so, of it picks up. Yes, yeah, so it goes back to that velocity. velocity. It doesn't necessarily mean velocity in terms of buying goods and services, but just it could be the velocity that's spent on buying financial assets as well. Right. So I know that that's technically not part of velocity, but basically just how it circulates, the dollars circulate. Yeah, that's great. That makes a lot of sense. So now let's, let's if we could just hop over to repo. Uh, 2019, the, the repo spike. And the, this is, I, I always try to figure out why this happened. And it, it's, it, you know, the common thing is there just weren't enough reserves in the system. And so the Fed just needed to inject reserves. But then, then I go back to what we were saying about JP Morgan being able to create the cash. It wasn't really the, the reserves that were needed. It was more cash. Mm -hmm. And it was that JP Morgan wasn't willing and just using yes. them as a proxy, you know, yes. to to give the banks cash. And therefore, in my mind, and correct me if I'm wrong, I didn't see it as a lack of uh, of bank reserves, but more so an increase in counterparty risk that prevented the banking system from providing that cash, even if that was a liability of a commercial bank instead of a liability of the Fed. So I actually, I also agree with you that I don't think it was driven by a lack of reserves. But I would ask something else, though. So when you're thinking about a bank, whether or not they're willing to make a loan, it's not just about whether or not a big part, a, one big part of it is the regulatory costs in making a loan. So after um, after the great financial crisis, banks have a lot more regulatory restrictions. And so one of them is that uh, they, they uh, have a so it's costly for them to expand their balance sheet and make loans and so forth. So. They don't want to do that unless, of course, it makes a lot of sense to them. So at that time, you're exactly right. A bank could have just stepped in, you know, just created a liability and lent in the repo market and everything would be fine. Um, but a couple of things, the, the banks start lending the repo. That's not really their core business. What they were is just trying to, you know, they have a lot of extra cash from the Fed, just putting in a little bit in repo to earn a little spread. And, and secondly, if they wanted to create more liabilities, create loans, no, there's a there's a regulatory cost to that, and it's not necessarily mm. worth it if for just an extra few basis points. So, what do you think triggered that? Yeah. So again, so back then, what was happening was that there was tremendous demand for repo borrowing from from investors. They were all, you know, borrowing in repo, and that squeezed demand for repo so much that the repo rates were trading above interest on reserves. It wasn't like that until let's say sometime in 20, early 2019. And then when the banks saw this, well, gosh, I have a whole bunch of reserves, you know, cash on deposit at the Fed, earning interest on reserves. You know, from a regulatory standpoint, it's actually neutral for me to invest in repo versus holding cash at the Fed. So I'm just going to move a little bit of my cash into the repo market to earn a little bit of extra spread. But at the same time, quantitative tightening is happening. So, you know, maybe I'm, I'm a bank and I have $100 billion in excess cash that I could just kind of play around with. After quantitative tightening, maybe I only have $50 billion extra cash to lend in the repo market. So 
I can't expand my lending anymore because I don't have as much extra cash. But repo demand is, is not really changing. It's actually growing. So you know, increasing demand, reducing supply, poof, air pocket. I, I think that's what happened in uh, 2019. Okay. And, and if I'm understanding you correctly, because a lot of the lenders in repo were non-bank entities. And so they were constrained. They, they, they had cash constraints where banks might not, like JP. Yes, Morgan. exactly right. So the marginal lender uh, was without doubt the commercial banks who were lending. Uh, the bulk of the market is, of course, non bank lenders, uh, money market funds specifically, but uh, the, the marginal lenders at that time, definitely the commercial banks to the tune of a few, few hundred billion dollars. Oh, George, I got I to gotta run, got to have uh, another spaces thing now. Oh, no problem, buddy. No problem. So we'll go ahead and end it there. Joseph, tell everybody where they can get a hold of you. Talk about the blog, the book, uh, where you're going to be speaking. Just let them yeah. know where they can find more of your content. Thanks so much. Um, so if you guys are interested in learning about central banking, you can check out my book on Amazon, uh, basically, you know, top rated and so forth. Um, if you're interested in learning more about what I do, I have a blog at fedguy.com. Or if you're interested, I have weekly updates on what's happening with the Fed and the markets at my new YouTube channel, uh, jo uh, Joseph Wang. Um, it's, you're not going to get as cool stuff as you as you get on RoboCop is Live, but you, know, you get, <laughs> you get uh, 15 minute videos every every week. And of course, I am speaking at, at Limitless uh, Financial Freedom Expo this week. And our George good buddy Kenny McElroy as well. Yes, it's going to be great. So hopefully I'll see some of you guys there. Yeah, And Joseph, what's your YouTube channel name? Joseph Wang. Oh, Joe. Okay. So guys, you've got to check that out. All right, buddy. I sincerely appreciate your time. Can't wait to do it again. All right. Talk to you soon, George. Bye.